This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. This Week in Virology, episode number 312, recorded on November 21st, 2014. Hey everybody, I'm Vincent Racaniello. And you are listening to TWIV, the podcast all about viruses. Joining me today here in the TWIV studio, Dixon Despommier. Hello, Vincent. How you been, Dixon? Been very well, thanks. I actually know that because I see you all the time. <laughs> you do. <laughs> and I guess I should ask you something else. Like, you could ask me something else. It's chilly out, isn't it? It's freezing. Zero degrees Celsius at the moment. Freezing. And it's been this way all, all week, although it's not going to warm up, is it? Yes, it is actually. On Monday, it's going, it's going up, up to sixteen. The 60s. Mm, that's nice. Which Wasn't ready for crazy. this cold weather. Yeah. Also joining us today from southeastern Michigan, Kathy Spindler. Hi, everybody. You have bad weather out there. It's beautiful. Not a cloud in the sky. Ah. Twenty-four Fahrenheit, minus four Celsius. Yesterday, uh, M- Michelle Swanson on Twim didn't want to talk about the weather. She <laughs> said it was so bad yesterday. Is that possible? I don't know. I was at. You were in Virginia. Tech. Was it nice there? It was very nice there. <laughs> yes. It's a bit warmer, isn't it? Yeah. And it'll be a really good site for ASV 2016. Oh. Yeah. I was there earlier this year. I really liked it. Mm-hmm. Very nice. It's just not easy to get to. Yeah. But, you know, you fly to Roanoke and they've got a $4 bus that takes you right to campus. Yeah, so. but getting to Roanoke, you can't get directly to Roanoke from anywhere. <laughs> eh, from you Atlanta. Can, <laughs> you can go from Atlanta. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So from Newark, I have to go to Dulles. Yeah. Also joining us today from North Central Florida, Rich Condit. Hi, everybody. I don't oh, want to hear sure. what the weather's like there. <laughs> right, we... I'm going to tell you anyway. <laughs> it's uh, clear blue skies, a few few scattered clouds, but mostly sunny and 71 degrees Fahrenheit. Are you wearing That's, shorts? Uh, Are you wearing shorts? Uh, no, I'm not. As a matter of fact, uh, uh, you know, I've got my jeans. I even got a long sleeve shirt on. It was cold earlier. We actually had a freeze. Uh, the previous two nights, and it trashed all the frost-sensitive plants in our garden. Oh. Mm. So, also joining us today from Western Massachusetts, Alan Dove. Good to be here. How's it out there? Oh, chilly. It's uh, I guess it's a little warmer here than it is there. It's uh, about one one to two degrees uh, Celsius here, and um, uh, clear skies, but windy. Windy. That's right. Windy. Winds Indeed. out of the northwest at sixteen to twenty-seven knots, which mm-hmm. is uh, mm-hmm. kind of brisk. Indeed. This episode of TWIV is brought to you by the Department of Microbiology at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. With over 20 virology labs all in one building in the heart of New York City, the department's a perfect fit for anybody who wants to work on viruses. They are looking to recruit graduate students, apply to the program, December 1 deadline coming up real soon. You can go to mssm.edu slash mic, and if you want to do a postdoc, go to the same site and check out the faculty. Or if you want to be a faculty member, check out the dean. (laughs) (laughs) You're so funny. People are going to complain. We have to be serious. I hope they don't complain about that. That's what you should do. (laughs) I have to add one thing. Uh, We were informed that there's a new manager of the Roanoke Airport, and it's been renamed the Roanoke Blacksburg Airport, and they Uh, have hopes of getting more direct flights to come back. You know, uh, next year is ASV, which is in Western Ontario, right? Or London, Mm -hmm. Ontario. Um, They just made a direct flight, oh, you know this, to Newark, New Jersey. Mm Mm-hmm. Started in October, and they knew I was going, so that's why they did that it. That was very nice of them. The, the ASV meeting I went to in graduate school was in London, Ontario. Huh. You went to that one? Yeah. Yeah, I, I did too. Did I see you there? Uh, I think maybe. I no, guess. probably you, 1990. Yeah. Did you guys I present a paper together? <laughs> no, they, it would have been 94, I didn't, you, I didn't know you went to that meeting. Yeah. that was. was it's it, a nice site. I liked it. Yeah, it was in the 90s. It was... It's, uh, I. I I know that because it's the only time I've been to London, Ontario. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, we have a paper today. It's not. It doesn't have anything to do with Ebola, but there are just a few Woo! few brief things that I wanted to uh, comment on. Some of you may know that the White House has requested six point one eight billion dollars to help contain and end the Ebola outbreak in Africa. 
Now, I do not um, doubt that this is useful and will be nice and, and wonderful. However, if we had spent six point one eight billion in the previous ten years, we would have four Ebola vaccines and two antivirals. Well, we don't know that. <laughs> we could have. We could have. We would know. More, we would know more about. This I would say viruses. we should have because we have a number of vaccines which are ready to go into people, and some of them are, and they could have been put into people and been ready. The point I'm making is there's no foresight in science in this country. The scientists have it, but the people who control the money do not. And I, I don't think we're going to learn a lesson from this. This is really crazy. You know, and this $6.18 billion is not all we're spending. Every major hospital in this country has gone through Ebola preparedness. You know, go listen to TWIM, where I spoke to the lady from L.A. County. Mm -hmm. This is costing billions. And if we had a vaccine, we wouldn't have to do this. Now, what do we have to do to wake people up and get some vaccines for lots of viruses ready? I just don't understand. And, you know, this, this appropriation will probably go right through, right? Yep. So well, I just... I don't know. <laughs> Are you serious? I, I'm pessimistic about the whole state of Washington in the next couple of years. Oh, yeah. that. Yeah, well, that. But, you know, this is a politically hot thing. You can't really say no to this. It, it is. I don't know if they'll approve the full um, $6 billion. That's a, it's a lot of money. But, but it's just, uh, let's invest yeah, in, let's give companies contracts to make vaccines for MERS, SARS, you know, NEPA, Hendra, Marburg, keep LASA. Going. Keep going. You know, a bunch. And yeah. invest the money, stockpile well, them, and actually, be ready. They've done, they've done a little of that. Um, what? Which part? There, um, isn't there an H5N1 uh, vaccine that's been prepared and uh, it, obviously you can't test it in people at this point but uh, I think well they need that, to do at least a phase one so you don't have because that's what we're doing in with the Ebola right, vaccine. but I think right? they, they actually um, there there have been a couple of uh, with the flu viruses obviously have a manufacturing pipeline already in place and um, a, and the rationale was well we don't know if these are going to if these are going to become an issue but um, we'll we'll make it and and use the same protocol i think and uh and stockpile it and i i know those stockpiles have been put in place yeah um, that, that flu is a different animal flu is a different know. yeah flu is an easy one the real question is there are viruses out there with unknown pandemic potential right and you know everyone thought ebola or many people thought ebola wouldn't be an issue and now it is so i think we need yeah. just need to well get ready i remember when lots of virus was first uh, an issue back in the early 70s and they hired John Frame to go to Africa every year and collect convalescent serum. They weren't interested in developing vaccines. They were interested in protecting their workers in Frederick, Maryland, in yeah, case yeah. they caught it. But they weren't interested in vaccinating to prevent. Well, it's a shame we don't even have a, a LASA vaccine now. And it's mainly That's because right. the companies don't agree. see how to make money. And we should. Yeah. The, the developed nations should provide the money to do this. If you can come up with $6 billion in a couple of weeks... What the hell, you know, right? especially when 13 people died at Herxt of, of um, Marburg virus, which is why it was named Marburg virus, uh, that company should have certainly invested money in the, in the vaccine development, but they didn't do All that. right, just saying. Yeah, you're just saying. Uh, yes. Some of this funding includes uh, not only things for domestic things in the United States, but also to strengthen global health security um, enhancing the capacity of vulnerable countries to prevent disease outbreaks, etc. So it's yeah, not... It's good. I'm not oh, saying that it's bad right. stuff. I'm just saying right. we could have right. spent money and had not had to do a lot of this right now. Right. The, uh, the other thing that's nice about this uh, outbreak, though, is that they can no longer think about what happens over there stays over there. It's what happens over there can come anywhere. You, you really think that people will remember that after it's over? Well, I, just I, I think, think they so. will. I think they will. I, I do think they will. I think, I think that message has actually kind of gotten through in the past few years yeah, with SARS, that. uh, right, with, right. with bird flu. Um, people have realized that, yeah, disease problems anywhere in the world are global. And this right. message of, you know, air travel connects us all and anybody can get anywhere in 24 hours. Sure. Um, I think that actually has gotten out. I don't think that the public reaction to it has necessarily been all that constructive all the time. But um, yeah. I don't but think it, it's, it has. It, it hasn't gotten out to the point that we make vaccines that may not be needed right away. Right? Yeah. We, I mean, the political issue here is you don't get credit for things that didn't happen. 
Um, so yeah. it's it's difficult to it sounds like to get health. politicians on board with uh, yeah, right. with preemptive measures, but it's very easy to get them to react to stuff. Yeah, sure. crisis so. mentality. That's right. exactly right. got it. All right, uh, two other things over at ASM, the American Society for Microbiology. I have convinced them to put up an ASM Ebola FAQ. Uh, I've assembled a team of people including myself, Lynn Enquist, Ron Atlas, John Connor, Andrea Marzi, Elke Muhlberger, and Sean Whalen, and the latter, one, two, three, four, are Ebola experts to answer questions, and people send them in, and one of the experts uh, answers them. We put them up on this website. So um, I will put a link to that. What qualifies as frequently asked? <laughs> You know, just about everything <laughs> Twiv gets asked. I figure we could yeah. farm Does it over. Have to be asked more than once. No, it doesn't. It doesn't have to be, but just good questions. Um, okay. You can send them to Ebola at ASM dot org, and uh, they'll answer them. Um, and I think we'll farm some of our Twiv questions. We have lots yeah. still, and I think that would be useful. These are these are definitely frequently asked questions. Yeah, the ones that are there are. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. And finally. Some of you may have heard that a gentleman um, passed into India, and he had just recovered from uh, Ebola virus uh, infection, but they they held him at the uh, airport because um, they found the virus in his semen, and they're going to keep him there and check him periodically until he's virus-free. They won't let him leave. That could be a long time. Yeah, I mean... Um, he, I don't remember how long he's been, uh, he's recovered. But anyway, they checked his blood, it was virus negative, and uh, <laughs> they checked him three times Yeah. at the airport, and then they found it in his semen. So they're keeping him there. And I put this on Facebook, and someone wrote, happy man, question mark, exclamation point. Right? So. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting that they should do that. And someone also wrote, would they quarantine an HIV-infected person? And of course, they wouldn't um, be, because HIV is just spread mainly by sex right. and, and drugs and so forth. But Ebola is not just spread by sex. So if this gentleman spread it in some way, then it could be spread in other means, which would be a problem. However, I don't particularly agree with quarantining him. I, I think... Um, no. No. There's no evidence that for Ebola, right? There's one case for Marburg that you can be, that it can be spread sexually, but there's no evidence for Ebola yet. And as I recall, the Marburg case was pretty much anecdotal. There was one one, one case. description. It's one case, yeah. one, right. which is not Ebola, right? So we don't know. Of course, this is always the first time, but we'll see. Anyway, that's India's uh, decision to keep him there. I thought that was interesting. Okay, we have a paper. This That's week. enough about Ebola. Whee! That's it. That's it. Well, we have letters. We have letters. Uh, actually, do. one we more do. thing. Yes, sir. I've been looking at charts. It looks to me as if in some countries, and I forget the details, there's actually in recent weeks been a decrease in the number of cases. Am right. I reading yes. this correctly? Yes. yes. That's correct. I think it almost it's looks in to me as if you added up the whole, whole thing, the total counts, that it is not on the same trajectory, that it is... Uh, uh, not necessarily leveling off, but at least slowing down a little bit. This uh, strikes me as good news. I yes. think that's Liberia, but Guinea yes, is, is not the case. Well, it's it's that's not in good. the cities any longer. At least it's under containment. But in the rural sections, it's still rampant. But that's fewer people, so that's the reason why it's going down. Okay. Right. Anything else? Good. No. We have a paper in Science. One paper this week has to do with noroviruses. The title is Enteric Bacteria promote human and mouse norovirus infection of B cells. The authors are Jones, Watanabe, Shu, Graves, Keys, Grau, Gonzalez, Hernandez, Iovine, Wobus, Vinjay, Tibbets, Wallet, and Karst. And Stephanie Karst, the PI here, the last author. Um, we had her on Twiv, and we also had uh, Christian Wobus from the University of Michigan. So this is a collaboration. This is this is a very twiv uh, crew working on this. <laughs> it certainly is. Yeah, Florida centric. Both yes, Fl Florida and Michigan, right? And, and, and um, token representation from Atlanta. 
Uh, yeah, there's uh, actually about uh, four, <laughs> at least four, maybe call it, you could call it even six different labs uh, involved in this. Right. There's one, two, three, four uh, investigators from uh, UF and uh, one from the uh, CDC and one from NIH. So it's nice. quite a collaboration. Oh, and one from Michigan, Michigan. Christiana. Mm-hmm. So in this paper, noroviruses we've talked about on TWIV, but just to remind you, these cause the two-bucket illness, vomiting and diarrhea. They're right. plus-stranded, non-enveloped icosahedral viruses and major causes of uh, the two-bucket thing. Problem with noroviruses, the human viruses cannot be grown in cell cultures. So people have been trying and trying and trying. And if you go back to our TWIVs, we talked about that. Uh, mouse noroviruses can replicate, be replicated in cells, but we don't actually know where they replicate in mice. And I think Christian talked about that at our TWIV in Penn State mm-hmm. a couple of years ago. Mm-hmm. So in this paper, they ask, can they grow in B cells? Now, why would they? <laughs> this, this was not out of left field. <laughs> You know, but, uh, you know, the thing is, I don't know why they <laughs> didn't try. Right field. <laughs> well, we'll see later. I don't know why they didn't try before, but maybe they did and it didn't work for various well, reasons. Well, I think, the, I think uh, the assumption has always been, since this is uh, an intestinal disease, that the logical target is uh, intestinal epithelial cells, right? And so yeah, that's where yeah. people have been focusing right. their attention. But nobody grows polio in intestinal epithelial cells. But the intestinal epithelial cells also express those histo blood group antigens True. right and so that was another right. thing that's made people think well since hmm. the histo blood group antigens correlate with hum- human neurovirus strain uh, specificity of infection that that seemed to keep pointing toward those intestinal right. epithelial yeah, no, but cells you, you know if you can't get something to work you try every cell line in ATCC right <laughs> it just seems well, strange to me that it wasn't done before and, and in this case um there was some there was some suggestive evidence about B cells. You you muck with B cells in mice, and you can they don't get infected as robustly with the yeah, murine so that, norovirus. That's the more recent stuff, which made them try it. So right, and as we'll find yeah. out, in fact, if you had a human norovirus uh, sample and tried to infect a bunch of uh, and that is a purified human norovirus sample, and tried to infect a bunch of yes. uh, different cells with it, uh, yeah, that wouldn't work either. Well, right? that's a good point, because I'm not sure how purified the samples have been, so we'll talk about that. Right, so people traditionally isolate this virus, either human or murine. Um, you filter it. And that's, you- so I don't, yeah, they take stool, they feed volunteers, and then they collect their stool for sources of virus, but I don't know how extensively they filtered it, in particular because of the results that we're going to talk about here. Well, but let's do that con- later. Consider, I mean, with cell culture, you're usually trying not to put bacteria on them. Right. Yes. So, so you, uh, you another try to get well, a but virus. here in this paper, we're going to get they to did, it. Yes. but you they did. did not filter it enough to take the bacteria out. So that's right. why I'm asking this. So anyway, so in mice lacking um, some immune response genes, they they can see virus and B cell zones of the pyrus patches, which are collections of lymphoid cells in the intestine. If you infect B cell deficient mice, these are previous results. They're reduced virus titers from the mice. And you can also see virus proteins in B cells of infected chimpanzees. So this was previous evidence. That's why they looked in B cells. Uh, there's another, uh, another little uh, factoid here too, and that is in the old days when they did uh, the volunteer studies in uh, humans, uh, those volunteer studies uh, included not only uh, ingesting filtered stool from infected individuals and getting sick with the two bucket disease, but also uh, biopsies of intestinal epithelium, mm-hmm. and uh, yeah, they couldn't yeah. see any uh, any significant pathology of the epithelium. So that's a a clue that, or a, it was puzzling. In contrast to something like a rotavirus infection, where the intestinal epithelium is Crashed. Right. Okay. All right. Quick question: What other viruses replicate in B cells? Uh, a lot of herpes viruses. viruses. No, I, I got quizzed this. I actually <laughs> asked that question this morning, so I got yeah a lot insight. of herpes viruses. What did you say, uh, Kathy? Uh, DNA viruses. Uh, Does Adno do B cells? Ep- Epstein Barr virus. Yeah, Epstein Barrs do. Do any other RNA viruses replicate in B cells? That's mm. a good question. 
In fact, it's a. Uh, I think influenza does. It's a, a question that one of our faculty members is asking. Yeah, that's true. There's a paper was recently published on that. Actually, right. We're going to get a lot of mail on. We this should one. do that paper. <laughs> that's a cool paper. The flu in B cells. Yeah. Hmm. All right. So they use uh, to start. They use murine norovirus strains. Two strains. One and three. One right. it causes an acute infection. Three it persistently infects cells. And the, the 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 important thing here is that the um, uh, the in the Miri neurovirus system, you can actually culture the virus. Yes, you can grow the virus right. in culture. You can do plaquettes, as you can do all that stuff. Yep. You can infect mice. Uh, you can get a pathology mm-hmm. in mice. The mice don't uh, barf. And they don't get diarrhea, which has been a criticism of the of the mouse model. But if you sacrifice the mice, you can see uh, pathology in the test intestine that's quite quantifiable and quite reproducible. So, uh, in in uh, all respects, the mouse model mimics the human disease, um, and it's uh, much easier to work with. Right, but it's in the mouse. It's more of a systemic thing. They get this encephalitis and hepatitis and all these other. Uh, well, actually, that's an interferon knockout mice. If you knock out interferon, uh, right. you get a systemic disease, and that's not really a good mimic of the human disease. But in right. the wild-type mice, it's pretty much confined to the intestine, uh, uh, like the like the wild-type disease. This is people have been uh, there's uh, people in who work on the mouse norovirus have been frustrated for a period of time because uh, they get a lot of resistance to the mouse model because it doesn't uh, fully mimic the human disease. But I think this paper shows us... This will shut them up. This, I hope so, okay? Because yeah. the mouse model rocks, okay? It really pointed them down the right path here. So the mouse cell line that's typically used is is a macrophage cell line called RAW, raw cells. So that's how they can grow the virus, the mouse strains. And they um, they have two mouse B cell lines. They're called WEHI and M12. WEHI? W-E-H-I. That must come from Australia. You bet, Dixon. Walter and Eliza Hill Institute. Hall. Hall, Not sorry. Hall. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> it's okay. What's the difference? <laughs> uh, that's, if you're there, there's a big difference. <laughs> yeah, I went and saw it this summer. Yeah. WEHI. I spent my six months Anyway, the virus there. will grow in these two B cell lines, the mouse viruses will grow in the 2B yep. cell line. Yep. Um, and they determine virus titers in this particular experiment by TCID50, the amount of virus you need to infect 50% of the cultures. I was so happy to see that and not PCR initially. Uh-huh. There's some PCR later. But I'm glad they do virology. They even do plaque assays in this paper. Look at that. This mm-hmm. is very thrilling. <laughs> <laughs> well, These people have been on TWIV. They know what they're doing. <laughs> this is Virology 101. <laughs> and they tried a mouse epithelial cell line, and the virus does not infect them. Right. Now, they do say, I, I'm a little picky here. I'm sorry to be picky. They say the epithelial line was not permissive, mm. but it's not susceptible and permissive because mm. we don't know which one. We used on TWIV anyway, permissive being internal mm-hmm, mm-hmm. replication, susceptibility having right, receptors. Right, anyway, it's right. a minor point, but I couldn't resist right. being the um, grammar police, right? All right. Oh, you, you come by it honestly, Vincent. It really. <laughs> All right. This one B cell line called M12, they infect. Uh, they don't get cytopathic effects. The cells don't die. Uh, in WEHIs, the cells do die. And uh, they say, well, maybe that's because M12s are mature B cells, whereas mm-hmm. WEHI are not. Mm-hmm. They are immature B cells. Uh, the mouse strain 1 killed these WEHIs. Um, in the M12s, they see transient killing, and then the cells recover, and they can grow the cells and pass them, and they continue to produce quite a bit of virus. Right. So both uh, noroviruses, one and three, will do that. That's pretty cool, and that's something which is worth Very studying, cool. right, to figure out how. Yeah. yeah. So if and, a small... Uh, the, uh, the virus establishes, can establish a persistent infection in the mice, so this uh, persistence uh, in these particular B cells in culture may be relevant. And yeah. And there's, uh, there's not really a persistent infection in humans, but humans shed virus for a long time. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that could be relevant in that regard as well. So next they asked to B cells in mice get infected and the evidence is really good so they feed virus to mice and they can look at virus titers in the intestine and they see if you use mice lacking b cells you can get genetically altered mice Um, they make less virus in the distal ileum and the lymph nodes the mesenteric lymph nodes than mice than wild type mice 
and there's actually less replication, not just quicker clearance because they use a cool assay using neutral red virus, which is light sensitive virus. So you can distinguish the inoculum from what is actually replicated. So once the virus replicates, right. it loses light sensitivity, which is conferred by neutral red. Hmm. A very cool assay. Yeah. Alan, didn't you do something like that? During I your thesis? did. Well, I had a Dickens of a time getting the neutral red thing to work. Um, <laughs> Charles Dickens? <laughs> yeah, no, it's a, it's a pain. Um, obviously, you know, you got to keep them in the dark and then right. you expose them yeah. to light. Um, and uh, I ended up doing um, uh, labeling, radioactive labeling of, of capsid right. and, and genome. I uh, had to work with orthophosphate, which freaked a lot of people out because you just kind of walk by my bench with a Geiger counter and it would scream. <laughs> um, but... Uh, uh, yeah, so I ended up I ended up having to label the virus to get my um, my assays working. Mm -hmm. But yes, I did I did briefly work with. I really like the neutral red assay. Approach. Cool. Uh, the other evidence is that um, you infect mice. You look in Peyer's patches, which are again the collections of lymphoid cells in the intestine. You find uh, viral genomes there, and you can also see viral proteins if you use stat knockout mice. That is mice that are deficient in, in uh, innate immune signaling, in which case you get more viral replication. And this, as far as I know, the first time that anyone has seen uh, viral proteins in a particular cell in mice. I remember Christian talking about how hard it is to figure out where the virus is actually replicating. Yeah, and those, uh, the, in that particular case, I think where you're getting the proteins, those are infecting the uh, uh, STAT1 knockout mice. Okay? Right. So that's a, a more rampant disease. So you get a, a, a larger virus load, and I think that helps you see the proteins. But Stephanie was, it was important to her to be able to do that in particular because she's assaying here for a non-structural protein, which in her mind is the best evidence that you're actually getting virus replication. Right. Because okay, mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. genomes could be input genomes, capsid could be input capsid, but a non-structural protein means the virus is actually replicating. And that's in B cells. Yeah. Well, the neutral red assay tells you it's neutral replicating red assay too. Is good, right? yeah. All right, what about human neuroviruses? Wow. Well, now you know why they looked in B cells. Take it, they have a human B cell line. It's called BJAB. You know where that's from, Dixon? No clue. I don't either. <laughs> anyway, they I use. I didn't do uh, my, post, my uh, sabbatical in that area. <laughs> they use a one, the currently dominant circulating strain, which is a genotype two from with the name Sydney, because that's where it was first isolated. So they have a stool sample well, from people from Australia. It sounds like. So they have fecal material, a stool sample. Now here's where we need to explore because I'm not sure what they actually do. They put this stool sample on the cells. And they, by PCR, they get an increase in viral genomes. If you UV irradiate the stool sample, you don't get an increase in genomes, right? And if you take the supernatants of these infected B cells, you can infect fresh BJ cells, and you get an increase in genome production. So it looks like they're making virus after applying the stool sample. Right. Now, when they filter this stool sample through a 0.2 micron filter you basically wipe out the infectivity. All right, so the virus is, is able to go through this, but you're possibly retaining something and that, and you don't get infectivity. So my- yeah, so, so classically, just to, to say that again another way, when, when you filter things, it, what comes through as virus and what stays behind would be the bacteria and really large viruses. Which is why they were originally called filterable agents. Yeah. So this means to me that the stool sample that they used for this experiment was not put through a 0.2 micron filter, right? right. Mm -hmm. yep. Now, right. is it? do I understand then that previously anyone who tried to infect cells with a stool sample had filtered it through a 0.0 micron filter just Probably. to make sure? Most likely. Probably. Wouldn't you think if you were putting a stool sample on your tissue culture yeah. cells, yeah. you'd yeah. want to get rid of all the bacteria first? Right. You'd try to so do why that. were they able to get away without filtering it? From materials and methods, um, supplementary materials, stool samples were not processed prior to inoculation of cells unless otherwise indicated. What does processed mean? I'm they not just, sure. They make a dilute solution of the stool and just slap it in there. So they do make a dilution, otherwise you have a lot of material. Yeah, sure. So, uh, and they're not getting contamination of their cells. Well, there's a lot of other things in there besides bacteria. Well, they're not too. getting contamination fast enough to 
mess yeah. up the experiment. Yeah. Right. Uh, yeah, and I don't. Uh, I should have uh, asked Stephanie about this. I'll. T- I'll t- did they put? Well, uh, we can do wait, follow they might up. Have a bunch was, of, they might have a bunch of uh, antibiotics. I was just going to say that's yeah. probably. Yes, right. they, they even say, okay, now I'm I'm still you digging through materials and methods. Um, sure. Supplementary material, figure five. Uh, virus passaging studies, they're infecting uh, the BJAB cells with unfiltered stools. Mm-hmm. And then they wash okay. uh, They wash after two hours to take off the unbound virus, and they say wash cells extensively. So <laughs> right. I think they're hoping to get out most nah. of the bacteria most at that point, bacteria, too, because the yeah. bacteria will not have penetrated the cells, and you should still be able to wash them out. Yeah, right. yeah you can never get rid of them all. But maybe, as you said, it's quick they're enough probably, so that... probably got antibiotics in the culture. Maybe. Tons of I'm antibiotics. Sure. Yes, that, too. So I was talking to a norovirus person this past weekend, and she said, you know, we try so hard to keep the bacteria out of our stool samples, <laughs> and now we shouldn't. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> can add something else, as oh, you well. see. Uh, so anyway, that's pretty cool. Um, so here, I have a question. So they do a, this experiment where they pass, so they infect these BJAB cells with stool, unfiltered stool, they get virus production, and they take the soup and pass it again. Mm. I presume they're not filtering that soup, and they're they've got some carryover something, Must be. right? Yeah, Must be that. Okay. Yeah. All right. So they do. So here's an interesting question: uh, in the intestine, B cells are below the basement membrane, yes, right? They are. You got epithelium on top, right? So. How does the virus get through? They have a, a nice cold culture system where they have uh, epithelial cells sitting on a membrane and B cells below. This is a typical polarized kind of cell system. So mm-hmm. they add virus on top. Or they actually add stool extract. The membrane has a has a layer of uh, it's a cultured epithelial cell line, polarized on top, epithelial right. cell. So you're actually and they actually test that to make sure that it's impermeable to like dextran or something like that. Right. So is they know they've got a, an yep. intact barrier of epithelial cells between the top and the bottom parts of the chamber. Uh, Rich, is that a, a polarized? Uh, yes. Okay. Yeah. So they add virus to the top, and then they find it. Sorry, they add the stool filtrator. Whatever you want to call it, stool extract, stool sample. Stool sample. That's right. <laughs> and you add it to the top. I've and always then... wanted to do this to my experiments. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, I did it many times inadvertently, of course. <laughs> and then on the bottom, the B cells end up having viral genomes in them. And if you take out the B cells and then do the same infection, you don't see any virus produced. So you need the B cells, and somehow the virus is getting across the epithelial barrier t- into the B cells, which is a nice thing to be able to explore in the future as well. Right. Now, I can think of two ways they could have arrived at this point. Either mm. somebody forgot to filter the stool sample and put it on, right. and <laughs> wow, hit it, hey, it actually infected. Yeah. Or um, they had some inkling that maybe the bacteria in the stool sample were part of the of the infectious cycle for this virus. Well, I mm. think that they probably talked to Julie Pfeiffer, who finds you need bacteria to have a good right. polio infection in the mouse gut, right? I'm sure they right. ran into each other somewhere, and Julie oh, said, yeah. you know, you ought to try not filtering. <laughs> <laughs> and she probably didn't say stool. Right. You know, <laughs> just like throw Julie. some, yeah. Uh, and there's also the, uh, what we'll get to, the uh, histo blood group antigens, okay, that are on the bacteria and yeah, elsewhere, right. okay? So that may Might have be been a bridge part between, of it, too, yeah. yeah. All right, so what is happening when you filter the stool? So they said, well, maybe the bacteria are helping. So as as Rich just said, norovirus are known to bind histo blood group antigens. And um, these are carbohydrates, basically. And we, the, the, the structure of this interaction is, has been studied at X-ray crystallography uh, resolution. I, I stuck a picture in the, the show notes showing that. It was nice. Um, these antigens are found in host cells and in bacteria. And a specific bacterium, Enterobacter cloacae, makes an H-type histo blood group antigen, mm. which is known to be bound by this Sydney virus that they're using. Mm. And it's, uh, it's been known for some time that uh, certain <clears throat> individuals with certain blood types Mm-hmm. Susceptible to certain norovirus infections, so that implicates the oh, histo blood group antigens in the uh, infection process. And following up on that, it's also known that the norovirus binds these things. Okay? That's right. So, 
Yeah, and we know in exquisite detail how they interact. So they simply added this bacterium to the filtered stool. Remember, they take the stool, put it through a 0.2 micron filter. They take what goes through. They add enterobacter. Boom. Can infect B cells in a mm. dose-dependent manner. The more bacteria, the better infection you get. It's really Remarkable. nice. Remarkable. So what's doing it? Well, they tried lipopolysaccharide. It's the first thing you would try because that's what actually works for polio. It can restore infectivity uh, in the mouse gut. That didn't work. That's, of course, a component of the outer membrane of gram negatives. Uh, they tried E. coli. Didn't work. And they then tried the actual H antigen, which is one of these histo blood group antigens. And that's a carbohydrate which can be obtained synthetically. So, And it did. So there you go. Now you can just add <laughs> this carbohydrate to your stool or your virus, and you can grow it, and you don't have to worry about bacteria. It's brilliant. Yes. Mm -hmm. So um, what does the physical arrangement look like for entry? Well, their idea is that uh, without the bacteria or the H antigen, the virus is not attaching okay. to cells. Uh, and and they, sh they show actually some evidence for that in the binding assay. So they think the, a the histoantigen is binding the virus, and that's helping it to attach to B cells. So the, B the, the B cells themselves don't express the H antigen. Right. So the H antigen is binding yeah. to the virus and somehow uh, facilitating the um, uh, infection of the B cells. So it'll be interesting to figure right. out how... That's working, right? How it's facilitating that's sure, going right. to be the key. My big personal question on this whole issue then is what is the mechanism of diarrhea and vomiting? What's going on? Because you know what's going on with cholera. You know what's going on with salmonella or shigella. Mm. You know what's going on with eostolytica or giardia. You can make a big list of diarrheal disease-causing agents, but here's one, well, like that's rotavirus. A good question. So how that's does rotavirus really work? And so how rota does... makes a, a protein that uh, screws up the fluid balance. Okay? Sure. But here, I mean, if it's infecting mainly B cells, exactly. what's it doing? That's a very exactly. good question. Exactly. Uh, there is some indication, uh, I think, in mice at least, in the mouse system at least, that... Uh, uh, one of the virus proteins, I think I've got this right, one of the virus proteins uh, may act as a toxin. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. So, I think that's so, in the human norovirus, too, that there's actually okay. a toxin protein. So uh, from that point of view, as long as you can replicate it somewhere, you could, uh, you could generate toxic effects. Somewhere in particular in the, you know, in the vicinity of the intestinal epithelium. So, so how different so are the mouse viruses from the human viruses at that, in that respect? Uh, I can't answer that question. I don't know. Yeah, what did you say, Dixon? Say well, when you compare the two viruses, the human versus the mouse norovirus, uh, and mouse doesn't develop any symptoms from the infection, but humans do, obviously, if the cause is the difference between those two um, proteins. Right. Well, well, the mouse actually does have symptoms. They just aren't overt like in the human, okay? Because, <laughs> in fact, if you, they have if loose you stools? look at the mouse intestines, yeah. Yes. Uh, in, oh, yes, oh, they are. They have loose stools. Right. That and the, in the, the intestines... Beginning. When you dissect okay. them out, the intestines are heavier because okay. they retain fluid. Okay. Okay. They just can't get rid of the fluid. All right. Okay. All right. So the so the symptomology on on some level is actually pretty similar. So okay. the pathogenesis, okay. I would say, uh, may very likely be right. uh, quite similar as All well. Right. Okay. Fine. And there's no way to if you have a humanized mouse, can you infect them with humanized <laughs> or with human neurons? Well, virus? that's what uh, Christiana was trying, uh -huh. and um, uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh, my recollection of that is that what she got was she got a little bit of amplification of the human norovirus but it wasn't in the human tissue in the mice okay it was somewhere else yeah yeah um, so it was a little off center yep she talked about that at twiv penn okay. state okay now the last experiment they treat mice with antibiotics to deplete their intestinal uh -huh. microbiota and they then they give them the Norovirus, murine norovirus, and as you might expect, they get you get a reduction in virus yield. So right. even in mice as well, these bacteria yeah. are helping get infection. So and you'd assume germ-free animals don't get any infection. I would guess that's in progress, right? But hmm. you know, it, then you'd have to reconstitute them and show them that you would, right, Dixon? Yeah, absolutely right. So now we have noroviruses, we have polio, mouse mammary tumor virus. These are all viruses that replicate in the intestine, and they've, they've right. evolved to uh, take advantage of the microbiome. So mm. I would bet that every virus that uh, 
yeah. replicates theirs has to in some way negotiate this big bacterial yeah. population. Here, here. I mean, take, taking advantage is a good idea, right? Yeah. Sure. Why That's not? Right. Can supply so, things. So. so there's an interesting uh, little uh, sideshow here or that, that doesn't – actually, it's uh, described in uh, Zimmer's uh, – Carl Zimmer wrote a, an, a, a blog – Yes. on this paper that we could put in the show notes because I think the other, the other articles, uh, the original article, and there's a, a commentary by uh, Robinson and Pfeiffer in the same issue of Science. Those are likely to be not open access, but the Zimmer thing you can uh, get, and that summarizes this whole thing. And um, uh, he uh, is the one of those three that points out this other little interesting idea about the susceptibility of certain blood types to certain noroviruses. That's always been interpreted as uh, if you have this blood type, you'll have those uh, histo blood group antigens on your epithelial cells, and so you'll get infected because right. the virus can attach. Uh, you could argue from this that if you have, uh, well, so um, uh, one argument you can make from this is that if you have a particular blood type, then that is recognized as self. And the bacteria that can colonize your gut will contain those same histo blood group antigens mm -hmm, mm -hmm. because they are recognized as self. And so the susceptibility that's reflected in the blood type doesn't have to do necessarily with which histo blood group antigens are on your your cells, mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. rather your which bacteria. commensal bacteria yeah, great. are permitted <laughs> to grow in your gut? Yeah, and which is blood that groups cool or they? what? What are they? And and it's pretty cool that the bacteria are carrying this yeah. antigen that's on your cells. Yeah, and that that's yeah. going to be. I mean, it's mm -hmm. going to be some. The story's going to wind up being that the the virus binds the bacteria, and that facilitates the uh, transit across the mm -hmm. epithelium and the infection of the B cells. Right. Dixon, it depends on the strain. You know, they use different bl so histo blood groups. all blood groups are susceptible, but each one has to be specific for that particular outbreak. Yeah, so this Hidney uses an H type, for example. Because I, I, mean, yeah. I was thinking about all these outbreaks that occur aboard ships, for instance, right? Because yeah. this is a big deal for, tra for travelers. Uh, does it just break down according to this Hypothesis. I, I think it's who gets six and who does. I think it's pretty complicated, but you're going to have some people in any given, uh, depending on the virus, some people in any given outbreak uh, that because of their blood type are resistant to that outbreak. Right. But you can have viruses. I think that uh, uh, bind multiple histo blood group antigens. You can mm -hmm. have uh, mm -hmm. commensal bacteria that express multiple histo blood group antigens. Matter of fact, that's why they tried this. Uh, e. cloacae is that it expressed multiple uh, histo blood group antigens, including yeah. this H antigen. Because at one time in history, this is thinking back quite a bit, maybe 20 years ago, there was a company that formed to take advantage of this uh, to try to develop lozenges that had specific sugars in them so that you could flood the system and prevent absorption or attachment if it depended upon that particular sugar. And then uh, I don't know what became of them. Uh, as to whether that actually worked or not. You know, for travelers that are frequently in areas of uh, high uh, risk for diarrheal diseases, that you're sure about whatever the attachment mechanism is, uh, you could just pop this lozenge into your mouth for the week, you know, and uh, suck them down and, and avoid uh, infection. I that wouldn't was, be optimistic about that working, but it'd be interesting to see if anybody tried. Yeah, I think they, there was a company, it was a startup, I don't know how far they got with it, and I hadn't heard anything more about that recently, so I, I presume that it got complicated very fast as yeah. to how, how to actually do it, but it was a great idea to begin with. Because I think in vitro you could easily show that that, that would work. You'd have to get a heck of a lot of a sugar in there. Yeah, yeah, I, I would agree. But you'd probably only take it just maybe during high areas of contamination, like during the, the daytime when you're walking around or just right, after a meal. Right, but I'm, I'm saying or, the, 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 to titrate out a sugar that's naturally occurring in your gut or on gut bacteria... Um, no, I didn't mean it for that reason. I mean, I, I was thinking for other pathogens that didn't relate to this particular oh, okay. concept. But, uh, but this would have certainly been thrown into the mix that they had known about it. At any rate. Anyway, so now you take a human neurovirus, you add 
synthetic carbohydrate, <laughs> and you can <laughs> infect human the- cells. You can do experiments, and so right. we look forward to lots of yeah, yeah. cool stuff happening yeah. here. Yeah, so. yeah, to me, this paper is kind of a uh, scientific hat trick. Yep. Okay. Yes. <laughs> um, the uh, first of all, it uh, totally vindicates the mouse model. Yes. Yeah, mm-hmm. uh, yeah. And I think people should. Uh, uh, understand. You know, I think one of the things that's special about this mouse model and several others is it's a matched host pathogen pair. Okay, mm-hmm. this is a a mouse neurovirus sure, yes. that sure, was sure, isolated sure. from mice originally, and there's several other models like that around. Uh, uh, Ectromelia virus, a pox virus in, in mice has uh, been uh, really valuable. Uh, uh, the gamma herpes virus, MHV68 uh, in mice. Uh, mouse coronavirus in mice. Oh, I'm sorry, Kathy. <laughs> Uh, yeah. Maybe mouse the adenovirus. mouse adenovirus <laughs> uh, uh, in yeah. mice, and those are those are really handy matched uh, host pathogen care. So that's the uh, pair. So that's one thing. Two, it's potentially a cell culture system for growing uh, human norovirus. And three, now we have a completely different perspective on the pathogenesis of this infection. It opens up a whole new a whole new window on uh, how this infection works. It's going to be very interesting to see how it parses out. Yeah, you know. Many people uh, appreciate mouse matched uh, pathogen animal models. There are a few who don't, and these cause trouble for for everyone because they get on <laughs> review sections. But you know, it's all part of this serendipity. You have to let people study what they think is important, and good things will happen. And don't tell people this virus isn't worth studying or this animal model isn't worth doing because you just never know. It's said a lot. It's, you just never know. True. All right, and then people who say this, you know, we shouldn't be doing this or that. It mm-hmm. it, it, it fails to recognize the this, this the stuff that you can learn from doing this. So mm-hmm. it's good. All right, let's do some email. Wait, yeah. I just wanted to say uh, oh. I really like Carl Zimmer's last uh, two sentences. That uh, now Karst hopes she can she and her colleagues can finally develop a recipe to brew up lots and lots of human noroviruses for research on vaccines and antivirals, and that's the only sense in which the phrase. Lots and lots of noroviruses can make us happy. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, wait till the gain of function people get hold of. Oh. <laughs> All right. Email. First email is from Bugabait, who writes, uh, who sends a link to an article uh, at the Peter Sandman Risk Communication website, which we talked about a bit way back during the Fouché Kawaoka controversy. Oh, yeah. These are individuals who. Think about risk. Um, and how to talk about it. How to talk about it. And this is called Ebola Failures of Imagination. And it is just an article about uh, where they think Ebola is heading in the future in terms of uh, spreading and endemicity and so forth. And it's worth a read. So check the, it out. The opening check of this out. thing is quite good. Mm-hmm. And, and the rest of the article is also quite good, but it, it really starts off in the right tone. Mm-hmm. Very thoughtful. All right. Alan, can you take the next one? Sure. Uh, Sandra writes, I learned about your podcast at the ASM meeting in Boston last May. Thanks for the tip. Here's some information that might be applicable to the topic of rapid screening for Ebola in airports or clinics. The FBI has promoted the development of rapid DNA analysis for law enforcement. The idea is to quickly generate a uh, a STR profile for someone when they're brought into a station for processing or booking, and to use the profile to search for a match in CODIS, the Convicted Offender DNA Index System, uh, within an hour. Currently, it can take weeks to to months for profiles to be generated through a crime lab. A talk this summer at a forensic DNA conference discussed a launch of the program in Arizona, so it's now operational. This technology could, in theory, be used to screen people for anything that could be detected by PCR. It's not inexpensive like a thermometer, but it is possible. And then she gives a link to this. She gives uh, yes. She, so there's a page on the FBI site about this program um, and uh, how they're implementing it and why. Yeah, it's just uh, from a, a little bit of blood from a needle stick, right? And I actually looked up, well, I mean, you can... I think they do it with a cheek swab. Cheek yeah, swab. I looked up this machine. It's pretty amazing, okay? Because you can stick almost anything into it, and it extracts DNA, does a PCR reaction, looking for short tandem repeats, runs a gel, and prints out a profile in the right. end. And you don't, all you got to do is stick the sample in and push a button. I mean, I can't, yeah. they got little robots in there or something like that? Yeah, I, yeah. it's a, it's... It's either microfluidics or uh, micromanipulators, and, and these types of instruments are, 
are the hot thing in in automation for um, so you don't have to train a technician in all the nuances of PCR or or whatever the technique is. Right. Um, and there there are, um, there are other techniques that are being rolled out this way too, like mass spectrometers right. uh, for explosion detection, explosive detection. Um, and these things can be set up someplace at a security checkpoint, and it's just a box with you know a spot where you stick swab here. Um, and so this is that type of technology. We're getting closer and closer to the Star Trek machine. What was that called? You, the tricorder. 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 You, can, you that's can't it. talk to anybody in the device <laughs> business for more than five minutes without them mentioning tricorders. Yes. <laughs> well, could Qualcomm, happen. Uh, Qualcomm had a contest and has still. It's in progress to develop a tricorder-like device to diagnose five diseases, and the winning prize would get ten million dollars. So. And the, the latest cool. trend in this type of technology is um, to try and develop things that plug into a smartphone. Right. Uh, yes. Because then you've got your computing power built in. Oh, you're right. And you, everybody's got it. You just you, there's an app for that. There is. An so app on for on that. Twim ninety, I spoke with um, David Persing from Cepheid, who whose company developed a, a PCR module, which is just remarkable. Everything happens in this module, and it's he calls it low skill. It can be used in a low skill environment. And they use these in the in the post offices to scan right. every piece of mail for oh, anthrax yeah. spores. It's right. really cool. Right, right. Yeah, so this this technology does exist uh, and could be used for this sort of thing. Um, the drawback, of course, is as these things get deployed, we're going to see a whole lot of things that were always there and were never a problem, and we're going to have rounds and rounds of "Oh my god! Oh my god! Oh my god!" Yeah, sure. Um, that's what we right. do. With, that's what we do now with PCR and pathogens. Yeah, so, right. So we're going to we're going to detect Microbes. stuff that we never saw yeah. before, and there will be there will be some noise in the signal initially. All right. The next one's from Alice, and this is short, so I'll take it. She writes, "Love them, but they are so long." I just don't have time to listen. And she's referring to Twiv, of course. Now, how do you know you how do you love them if they're too long to listen? All right? I don't get it. And is this like Yogi Berra? Uh <laughs> nobody goes to that restaurant anymore, it's too crowded. <laughs> right. But I, I notice she signs as an M D, so I presume her patients feel the same way when she's giving the medical <laughs> advice. <laughs> yeah, yada yada yada. I don't understand why you can't listen for 10 minutes at a time. Why Why are they yeah. too long? I don't get it. Put it on 2x speed and listen to it when you have some yeah spare time. 2x is too fast. <laughs> One and a half x works a lot of the time. But. Okay, right. 2x I can yeah. usually, well, episodes yeah. that I've, I I know what y'all yeah. are going to say. So, <laughs> Kathy, can you take the next one? Sure. Mitchell writes, hi, Twiff folks. I love your podcast. I'm impressed and appreciate that all of you not only spend the time doing the podcast, but also doing homework to prep for them. Also, as an aside, I'm happy to hear that real scientists can't understand and or read all of the articles in journals such as science. <laughs> as a non-scientist, I have trouble reading more than a very few articles in science. But enough of that. I've got a question. Can you explain how testing someone for Ebola works, especially when people going into quarantine, voluntary or otherwise, is such a problematic issue? For example, if someone had contact with an Ebola patient, could they be tested and avoid the quarantine? I'm guessing not, otherwise this wouldn't be much of an issue. Can you help me to understand this? Mitchell, He's from New Jersey, where it was 40 degrees Fahrenheit with winds at <laughs> really a lot of miles per hour. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a good, uh, uh, I put in a link here to a CDC uh, page on diagnosis of Ebola. That's a nice uh, summary. And uh, first of all, uh, before you're symptomatic, basically the virus load is so low that there's uh, no way to, uh, no easy way or no way to uh, detect it. Uh, but within a few days after symptoms begin or later on, there are a variety of assays. A lot of them uh, are uh, looking for either uh, virus proteins using immunological techniques uh, or your reaction to the virus, looking for uh, antibodies or PCR or uh, actual virus uh, isolation. But the the important answer is that before you got symptoms, there's just not enough virus around to see anything using a currently available techniques. Yep, that's it. Uh, Dixon, can you read the next one? Sure. Anne writes, this is a video prepared by the presenters of the epidemiology course currently in session on Coursera. 
It was posted about two weeks ago, so the information is a bit dated regarding the number of cases, but it is otherwise a nice summary of what's been happening and what needs to happen. Then there's a link to the uh, Coursera. This is a video. Um, the team that teaches this Coursera course, uh, right. they just talk about the outbreak and its control. Right. Still related to Ebola, although it doesn't say it specifically in the present. Yes, know, it's Ebola. I think it's we right. all knew what that meant. Uh, Rich Condit. S. David writes. These are, we have various flavors of Davids here. <laughs> S. David writes. The day we wrote the letter read by Kathy on water transmission of Ebola on 309 is not the day from Fresno, <laughs> whose relatively entertaining missives have turned up three or four times in the past year on a Twix. It might be the Dave who wrote suggesting Ebola survivors as immune nursing helpers in treatment settings, but I don't remember. I don't think I'm any of the other Daves either, but see the P.S. I am the Dave, a.k.a. SDS Delorge, who wrote several comments to NPR stories conveying some useful factual info on Ebola in early weeks, culminating in my impassioned recommendation of all things Twix in general, as well as for reliable discussion of Ebola. A little after that, I was pleased to hear Vincent interviewed, but have too little jet grandiosity to suppose I was instrumental in that. Mm -hmm. So, uh, uh, I guess Vincent got a Dave bump. Uh, it <laughs> has occurred go. to me to wonder if there might have been a bump in your podcast download numbers, though. That Dave is here. Since then, <laughs> I have not felt compelled to comment much further on NPR on that topic and haven't lately had much smart stuff to say either, despite repeated attempts. <laughs> but one respondent there a couple of months back informed me in no uncertain terms that Ebola lingered in semen for three months after recovery, but it wasn't uh, ever clear to me how she knew that. Could there uh, have been uh, could there have been more than one of her for you to have heard from too? It's mm -hmm. cooled off here. It's in the 60s Fahrenheit. We got measurable rain. Sleeping much better. I believe it's related. <laughs> Haven't communicated with Robin of Fresno about pulmonary embolism from leg thrombus progressing to clotting in cardiac or brain arteries, but he uh, is certainly essentially right that it is very unlikely. I was trying to be dramatic and pushing for compliance regarding your regarding wiggling your feet on long airline rides. Bloody Marys too. Warmest regards, Dave. P.S. Oops, I am the S. Dave whose letter was just read, preemptively bragging about the NPR bump. Did I mention my memory? Now you will be entirely justified in skipping this letter, except for the Fresno part. Goodness. All right, so this is Dave from Fresno, right? I guess. Okay, the other I'm, Dave. I'm confused, to tell you the yes. truth. <laughs> All right. Too many Daves. Too many Daves. Too All many right. Daves. Thank you. Oh, well, that's where that came from. Yes, okay. that's that's it. Mm -hmm. yeah. So the semen story, Dave, comes from a paper where they found semen for a long time. In, sorry, virus in semen for a long time. So that we we did cite that in a previous twist. And as Kathy has uh, pointed out previously, there seems to be uh, an, a, a real fascination, an obsession, it's an obsession, yes. <laughs> Mag uh, magnificent obsession. <laughs> Which, which apparently in India is leading somebody to be yeah. um, quarantined, yep. stuck mm -hmm. at the airport, imprisoned. This is at least the fourth twiv that we've talked about this. Yes, <laughs> it keeps coming. You got up. little Four marks on your wall, do you, Kathy? I'm starting. To. <laughs> <laughs> you put a cross across it the next time and <laughs> next, move on. <laughs> next email is from Elena, who writes, "Greeting twivsters from Toronto, Canada, where it's 12C and cloudy." I really wanted to wait until next month to write my first letter because it would have been written from Playa del Carmen, Mexico, oh, nice. where I'm spending the winter 26C and sunny, in case you were curious. Mm -hmm. Last week in TWIV 309, listener Timothy asked if you knew of a place to get information about the number of beds, etc. I can help. WHO releases a, an Ebola virus disease outbreak situation report twice a week. I love referencing it because I get to use the phrase WHO sit rep in conversation, which makes me feel cool. <laughs> in any case, the sit rep has a lot of information, including the number of available and required beds. Here's the link. I discovered TWIV back in early August 
and I've been catching up like a mad woman. I've been jumping around a lot, but I'm averaging one about every day and a half. I could have listened to more if you hadn't rekindled my love of molecular biology, <laughs> which inspired me to join the Coursera Systems Biology Specialization. Oh. P.S. My undergrad degree is in computer science, but I've had a lifelong affair with biology and am one of the co-founders of Do-It-Yourself Bio Toronto. I'd like to suggest another link for the epidemiology data nerds out there. Virginia Tech PhD student Caitlin Rivers' GitHub repo where she and other contributors collect, clean, and post Ebola virus disease epidemiological data from many different sources. And she gives a link to that, which is very cool. Thank you, Elena. Yeah, I like this WHO SITREP situation sit rep. report. Yep. yep. So it's like Wolf Blitzer. <laughs> we are back to Alan. Okay. Uh, Dominic writes, Dear Professor Racaniello and Twiv colleagues, I'm aware that you and your colleagues screen the current literature intensively. Nevertheless, I would like to call your attention to a paper our group has published a few days ago describing the treatment of an Ebola patient with best supportive care. Uh, and gives the uh, reference for the paper in New England Journal, New England Journal of Medicine. The paper has been published online ahead of print and thus might not have, been, uh, have uh, come to the attention of everybody involved in the care of EBVD patients. This might be of interest, especially in resource-limited settings. In addition to this, we also provide some evidence, at least on a case report level, to answer questions like, how long is a patient infectious? We performed serial PCR tests from various body body fluids, blood, saliva, urine, stool, sweat, and teardrops to detect EBV RNA after clinical cure, but in respect to Lin Fa Wang's statement, PCR is not virus, episode 296, <laughs> we also perform plaque assays. <laughs> All right. <laughs> <laughs> Real As a comment to a statement in one of your recent TWIVs, I agree with you that negative pressure rooms and BSL-4-like conditions are not necessarily needed for protection of medical staff, but it appears to me that especially the decontamination process is a crucial step. Decontamination might be more reliably achieved when showering with 2% peroxyacetic acid. As a res result, Germany decided to centralize the treatment of patients with viral hemorrhagic fevers in specialized units, which have been built in recent years. Keep up the excellent work. Best regards, Dominic. On my way back from a skiing trip at Hinterux, Austria, uh, Hintertux, Austria. Clear blue sky, minus six Celsius, one hundred mm. centimeters of fresh powder. <laughs> All right. P.S. Just for your background, uh, I started my career in the lab of Heinz Feldman at the Institute of Virology in Marburg, Germany, working on hantaviruses. Same institute where Elke Mühlberger comes from. After finishing medical school, I ended up as a specialist for infectious diseases and intensive care medicine in the Department of Intensive Care Medicine at University Medical Center, Hamburg, Eppendorf, Germany. Nice. Which so, is where he is now. It's a very nice paper, actually, which uh, follows patients um, for virus loads in various places. And this is information, you know, that we didn't have before. So uh, it it's worth looking at. It also tells how they cared for them. Mm -hmm. uh, I, <laughs> I'm amazed. Listen to this. Um, they uh, so the the therapy intensive supportive treatment. So this oh, is yeah. this is one payment it consisted of high volume fluid resuscitation, approximately ten liters per day. Right. Broad spectrum antibiotics. He had a septicemia. Ventilator support. Wow. Ten mm -hmm. liters a day. But this is this is not any of the whiz bang uh, so called secret serum or anything no. like that. No. This is this is stuff Just that any theory. any developed world yeah. hospital and some developing world That's hospitals right. should right. have available. Yeah. Right. And I see this article is open access by New England Journal. Nice. So good yeah. on them for making it freely available. It's even more interesting. Yeah. This guy has a degree in tropical medicine as well. Yeah. Kathy, you're next. John writes, Dear Twiv Bolands, in Twiv 309, <laughs> it was stated that Ebola epidemiology was not supportive of sexual transmission. HIV was held up as an exemplar of classic epidemiology for sexual transmission. Having been in medical school during the early AIDS years, I can assure you that in those years, it was not at all clear that AIDS transmission was sexual. Other correlates of the gay lifestyle were considered as possibilities, for example, the recreational use of, use of amyl nitrate. It was all extremely confusing, nor was it even clear that heterosexual transmission could occur. That knowledge came later and was for a while stubbornly resisted. Confusion arose, too, when hemophiliacs and IV drug users started getting the disease, apparently non-sexually. Thus, the real lesson of HIV-AIDS is that epidemiology is messy. In that sense, HIV-AIDS is a great exemplar for Ebola, because Ebola epidemiology is a very noisy signal right now, far noisier than AIDS ever was. 
Record keeping and Ebola outbreaks is atrocious. No one wants even to touch paper from the sick room. Today, no one even knows the correct number of Ebola cases, and the outbreaks of the past were small. Thus, there may very well be other signals lost in epidemiological noise, as the hemophiliac and IV drug user signals were initially hidden in AIDS noise until they got larger and people started looking at those populations with more diligence. Mm. So, I don't buy your statements that the absence of Ebola in brothels is a major point against sexual transmission. Are you sure that brothels are open? Do you expect that a country with a non-existent public health infrastructure would be able to dispatch public health workers to survey brothels? Do you expect that health workers have been taking an occupational history from Ebola patients when no one is even able to count the patients? Do you expect that sex workers would be honest if asked about their profession? All of these considerations influence the signal-to-noise ratio. My prediction is that sexual transmission will become clearly apparent only after the main epidemic subsides, mm. because the small number of such cases are epidemiologically invisible or unclassified at present. I further predict that chron chronically infected male superspreaders will appear. These would be men who cannot eradicate Ebola virus from their prostate or testis, both of which are immunologically privileged tissues, i.e. tissues in which the body's immune system is blunted. See, for example, this paper. So far, in the few men checked, a surprisingly high percentage have demonstrated three-month viral persistence in ejaculate. Given that, if you checked a thousand convalescent men, no one would be surprised if the tail of the bell curved extended to 12 months or beyond, and there may ultimately be tens of thousands of convalescent men. The resulting epidemiology could therefore resemble that of loss of fever, where sporadic cases appear seemingly randomly between larger outbreaks. If sporadic cases of Ebola start appearing, Cher says, I'm not good at French. Cher, Cher says, long. Okay. <laughs> Which means uh, what in French? Run after the mail. Look, look, look for the, the man. man. Look for the man. There's, a, for the man. there's okay. an old saying, Cher, Cher la la femme. Femme. Uh, look for the woman when there's some uh, man exhibiting strange behavior. I see. Okay. One other <laughs> suggestion. In your discussions, why not drop the term airborne entirely? You have to explain it every time mm -hmm. you introduce it because your meaning is counter to the public's intuitive meaning. You cannot win a fight that redefines a word that everyone already knows. Speak instead of aerosol trajectories and ballistic trajectories, like one of the listeners wrote in. Keep up the great work. I can't tell you how valuable your Ebola coverage has been to me. Mm -hmm. Regards, John. And John specifies no need to use last name. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so I just I wanted to argue. say it has not escaped our notice that the questions about prostitutes are coming from John no last name. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, and, and also that nobody has observed sexual transmission of Ebola in any previous outbreak or in this correct, outbreak. Correct. Um, so this theory that, you know, it would become sporadic and become like Lhasa, well, it hasn't. It is. It doesn't. It doesn't exhibit that epidemiology. Um, and could it happen? Well, well, sure. You know, pigs could fly. It's it's a it's very hard to prove a negative. And yes. even if there is a transmission of the virus from someone's semen, I'm still probably not going to consider it a sexually transmitted disease in the same sense that HPV, papillomavirus, um, HIV, and so forth are. Mm, right. I mean, and you can still I, argue that it's being transmitted by bodily fluids, which is what we've been right. saying all along. Yeah. And as I recall, we did actually figure this out pretty quickly about HIV. Yeah. Um, so I mean, yeah. there were a lot of there were a lot of theories that continued to float around, but the initial transmission mechanism became clear relatively quickly. I mean, historically, he's right that there were some there was some confusion in early years, but we brought up HIV as the classic sexually transmitted disease as we know it today, right? Right, yeah. Not yeah. from a historical perspective. Right. So I think that's still correct. Right. I do appreciate the uh, description here that epidemiolo epidemiology is messy. Absolutely. It is. Okay? Absolutely. Uh, and that's, 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 a, that's an important lesson. And I think we should hold him to his prediction that yeah. sexual transmission will become apparent. Okay. We'll see. we'll see. And that chronically infected male super spreaders will appear. And according to this, <laughs> that poor guy could be in the air airport for a year. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or, yes. you know. Yeah, what if, it, what if the guy sh sheds for, uh, you know, yeah. months and months and months? What are they going to do? Mm. Poor guy. Mm. Yeah. Airports are not fun places to be. That's for sure. Dixon, can you take Jacobs? Sure. You're giving me all the hard ones. 
Jacob S- writes. Random, Dixon. Yeah, I have a list here. <laughs> <laughs> that's okay. He gives a website first. Uh, it's a Google website that says that if you give uh, $1 towards uh, fighting the Ebola outbreak, Google will give you $2. We'll give Two we'll dollars. donate two dollars. Yeah, that's right. They'll, they yes. will. So it's uh, three dollars altogether, and the the letter actually reads, "Hi all, there are a lot of Twiv listeners who want to help out with the Ebola virus outbreak. This might be a great way to do it. For every dollar you give, Google will donate two dollars. Thanks, Jacob, Sydney, Australia. Nice. Okay, if you want to donate, there you go. Yep. Good for Google. Good. Go yeah. for it. Exactly. Rich, you're next. John writes, dear Twivers. The CDC temperature monitoring algorithm for Ebola was discussed towards the end of TWIV 309. I'd like to offer an alternate view. The discussion highlighted the wide range of body temperatures found in normal humans and the resulting difficulty of specifying a single threshold temperature above which a person is considered to have a fever. The alternative is to monitor for temperature change rather than monitor for an absolute temperature. For people who are performing post-exposure or self-monitoring of their temperature, this is easy. In almost all such cases, a person's temperature readings uh, in the initial few days after exposure can be averaged and used as the baseline temperature for that individual. Then we watch for a spike above that temperature where the size of the spike is greater than some threshold amount. Using this approach, the, uh, the bell curve of normal temperatures ceases to be a concern. With a little extra work, I think that really that really tight deltas of even one degree Fahrenheit could be used to detect the earliest hours of a fever, specifically body temperature as a circadian rhythm, so it would be best to compute separate uh, separate averages for morning versus evening temperatures. It would also be wise to ensure artifacts were not corrupting the temperature readings. This can happen after drinking hot liquids, exercising, smoking, and so on. The big problem with building a highly sensitive algorithm is complexity. It becomes impossible for CDC to put the algorithm on a poster. <laughs> uh, but they could put it into a smartphone app in which a person enters their self-monitored temperatures longitudinally and the app decides whether to raise an alarm or not. If there are any medical students living, uh, listening, living, <laughs> listening, <laughs> it would be a fun <laughs> algorithm and app to develop. At least you'd learn a lot about uh, the practicalities of body temperature that would serve you well during residency. You're here. John, no need for last name. That's right. I think the best thing would be a watch that could just measure your temperature and do this automatically with an app, uh, right? There you go. Yeah. Um, I think this is a good point, except... And then those data could be subpoenaed. Yeah, that's that's fine. <laughs> I know, I know. Well, look, they're they're subpoenaed. They're, they're listening to our cell well, phones. No, right? I mean, Apple's building a watch now that'll that'll monitor your health and, I don't know, yeah. sell you stuff. Yeah, it's true. Um, <laughs> this, At the same I, I, time. I think it's a good idea, but... This is going to take a while to implement, right? So yeah. for the moment, we have to have a, yeah. a certain temperature it, going above. It does make points, though, about the fact that temperature changes, yeah. you know, with circadian rhythm and that, you know, everybody's temperature changes. And yeah. so it's really hard to just use one single measurement. All right. Uh, the next one is from Elise, who writes, Dear Twiv, Twip, Twim Collective, I've been listening to you for years. Full disclosure, my gateway was through Twip, since I've been intrigued with parasites ever since I was in college, and I have no background in science and medicine. I'm a writer, screenplays, and etiquette books. <laughs> huh. But I have a powerful interest in disease, parasites, viruses, and bodily phenomena, and love hearing about your work. I'm sure I have many questions for you all, but in this quick note, I wanted to thank you all so much for everything you do. I listen to your podcast really at every opportunity, and I'm really grateful for the careful way you talk, explain your thinking, and humor such a wide range of ideas. In moments when I am feeling particularly isolated, it is a pleasure to listen to you all, and so nice to hear your camaraderie. Best wishes from a fan in Lower Manhattan, where my weather is probably <laughs> quite similar to yours. Sometimes <laughs> depends on what's going on on Wall Street. However, <laughs> it's just a lovely letter. Thank That's you great. so much. That's really Thank nice. you. We That's appreciate very nice. it. That is very How nice. can you feel particularly isolated in Lower Manhattan? <laughs> oh, that happened. Not, uh, it's not hard. It's to be surrounded by people and lonely in New York yeah, City. This is true. Yeah, that's entirely possible. True. Alan, you're next. All right. Chris writes, hello, my early background is in biochemistry, so I'm not fully informed on virology, but I heard an MD discussing how there were significant quantities of viruses in bodily fluids, say sweat. Before the 100.4 degree uh, Fahrenheit temperature, the CDC establishes for being contagious with Ebola. Is that true? 
So if one is infected with Ebola and runs around the New York City subway on a hot day with a temperature of 100 Fahrenheit and sweats, uh, s- sweats on seats, handles, etc., could they infect others? Wouldn't it be less of a risk for the American population and emergency resources if people from West Africa were quarantined 21-plus days before a flight to the U.S. rather than walking around until one finds one has 100.4 Fahrenheit? Thanks for your thoughts, Chris. No. No. Right. There's not enough virus present. Yeah. There's a, we did a study. We cited the study from CDC, JV. Before you're symptomatic, there's very little virus present. As as Rich said earlier, you can barely detect it in the, the earliest days. Um, there is epidemiologically no evidence that anyone, unless a sick person with Ebola, can transmit infection. Right. That's basically it. And I think that this is one of the reasons that the, uh, aside from the election, that the uh, sort of Ebola has left the front page in this country, and that is that the couple of scares with the Dallas patient and the physician returning to New York uh, turned up uh, no secondary infections, okay? Yeah, yeah. So we've had people running yeah. around in the in the population uh, here, and uh, there's been no spread. The only spread that we've seen here is in the uh, case of uh, Dallas, where a couple of nurses, probably through a breach in uh, procedure, uh, uh, and who had contact with a very sick individual uh, in a clinical situation got infected, but there's been no other secondary infections. So, you know, to follow, I mean, I know, Kathy, you're probably cringing right now <laughs> because we're still <laughs> belaboring these points, but it, it's it's really about fear versus concern, all right? I mean, if you're fearful, it's because you don't understand anything. And if you're concerned, it's because you have knowledge. And there's been a lot of knowledge that's been transpired through the popular press and through podcasts like ours and through the literature, the scientific literature and the, the, the um, I guess, the balanced uh, news literature, not Fox News, but, you know, the other, other news sources, so that people have become aware of the fact of what Ebola is. It's a virus, and it's transmitted this way, and it's not transmitted that way. And eventually, everyone comes down and says, well, you know, I'm not at risk because I, I understand a little bit about the way this thing works. You look at the outbreak of West Nile, it was the same way. You look at the outbreak of all these other diseases that are brand new. There's a big panic level that first uh, 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 characterizes the public opinion about what's going on. You start spraying this guy with malathion and stuff like this to try to get rid of every mosquito in the in the neighborhood, and the next thing you know, people are starting to calm down. So I think we're at the calming down stage now for the Ebola outbreak. Everybody in the United States is now fully aware of the fact that if you're given good medical care at a good medical center, the chances are you're going to live. I would love to believe that that's correct. That, that is this my is opinion. that this is fading from I'm public sticking. attention because no, no, people fading. have because Alan. people have actually understood that people that the the panic is is fading because people are actually understanding panic the reality. Of, yeah, I think the panic has stopped. I honestly do. Uh, think I think it has the stopped. panic is fading because the public has less than a four week attention span. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there are well, more happened are is, Yes, the the twenty one day uh, period elapsed since those those last secondary infections and so now we can go back to thinking it's a problem that's over there in some dark continent that we never have to think about um and now what's happened is oh gee there's a you know something else to pay attention to yeah but they don't do that for west nile anymore and it's here they know it's here yeah because it was in the news for more than a month and then it just faded no i, I understand that but i think it's it, people got tired of hearing about it and then they I moved on to the like, next thing <laughs> okay I, I'm sorry. I, I would, right, as right. I say, I would love to believe that you're correct. I just, I, okay. I don't see the world that way. All right. <laughs> I think we probably should move on to picks at this point, don't you guys? Yeah, that sounds Let's good. Do that. We have more. We have actually non Ebola email, but we'll get to that next week. Yeah, right. hopefully. All right, let's go down to the picks of the week. Dixon, do you have a pick for us? I certainly do, and it's a great pick, too. It involves Dr. Seuss. <laughs> it's a great pick, and how did this link end up in here already? Yeah, well. Yeah, I put it you, in this morning. Oh, oh, okay. Dixon okay. doesn't put Okay. He doesn't edit <laughs> the... Uh, I don't, but it's an actual, it's an actual story that yes. was written by Ted Geisel while he was a captain in the United States Army during the Second World War mm-hmm. to make learning about... A disease, which is very, very, very serious, in this case malaria, but other diseases too, like syphilis and things. Uh, it rhymes. It's a kid story, but it's not a kid story. And, and it's full of pictures, and you have to look at the pictures to get the words. And it's a fun read, right, about a very dangerous 
infection. <laughs> Malaria. Cute. And there's even a poster that I sent, Vince, and maybe you'll put that on the show notes also to show how, uh, how this was actually popularized throughout the South Pacific where people were really being attacked by malaria, but also in the um, European campaign too, Vince, because uh, I know that you're of Italian extract and your father was from Italy. Uh, Italy has a lot of malaria, or had a lot of malaria. Not so much after the arrival of DDT, but boy, before that, during the Second World War, they were ravaged by it, so a big deal. So there's this book that was written, all right, and that's where I actually got the idea for this because the book was reviewed in Science, and it's a book about uh, the malaria, the secret program during the Second World War, sort of like a Manhattan Project for malaria, and it was written. I'll get the exact reference for it. I guess you could find it in the book reviews this week in Science Magazine. Erwin Sherman wrote the review, and I knew someone who was involved in that program. His name was William Traeger. That's how he got interested in malaria to begin with. He was at Rockefeller, uh, in that case, the Rockefeller Research Medical Research Unit in Princeton when it was used to be located in Princeton, and then they moved to New York City. And during that time, this program was initiated, and he became a malariologist because of that. So some very famous malariologists were not so famous before that because they weren't malariologists. So they were the sort of progenitors for all of the current uh, infectious disease people that are now attracted to these very serious diseases. And I just thought it was a nice thing to add. I'm descended from somebody who participated in a related project. Look at you. Well, yeah, because your father was a, an entomologist. My, my grandfather was a medical entomologist right. at USDA who sure. uh, who developed DDT. Bingo. Uh, and and actually, the the neat thing about Dr. Seuss writing this is um, this was actually right in line with his first gig. <laughs> he got his start as an advertising writer and and cartoonist, and his most famous advertising slogan was. Quick, Henry, the flit. That's right. That's right. I I, I found that poster also in there yeah. someplace. Yeah, and it's a very a very Seuss style picture. Yeah, of, yeah, you know yeah, the, yeah. the flit gun. And if you go on uh, the Google Images and type, just type out uh, Doctor Seuss uh, World War II posters, you'll get the yeah. whole schmear. Yeah. It's kind very of cool. kind of fun. very cool. A lot thing. of fun. A lot of fun. Thank you. Anyway, this this is really cool because it's the story about Anne. Her full name is <laughs> yes. Anopheles. And also, you know. <laughs> that's right. Anne Ophelia, she's actually Irish. <laughs> <laughs> Alan, what do you have for us? I have an article. Um, this uh, uh, is about Ebola. I'm sorry, but <laughs> uh, but it's about how those those notorious airlifts of patients to the U.S. actually works. Mm -hmm. How this process uh. was actually carried out, and it's a. Um, uh, it's a, an article on the Aircraft Owners and Pilots Association website that I came across. Um, they uh, interviewed this guy who is one of the pilots um, of those aircraft, and he flies for a charter company that contracts with Department of Defense. And it talks, it's, it's not a terribly long article, but it really covers a lot of territory and, you know, things like people, people who saw footage of these of these the plane arriving with the patient on it, they're uh, saying, well, there's, there's this flimsy tent around him. Well, that so-called flimsy tent was actually developed at considerable expense for exactly this purpose several years ago. Mm -hmm. And they went through the process of getting it approved uh, by the CDC as well as the FAA for installation in, a, in this Gulfstream 3 jet, which has also been extensive. They've modified the ventilation system of the jet. I mean, they really thought this through and came up with this containment chamber thinking well if we ever need to do pandemic evacuations we'll we'll use this um and then after after they finished with that they um they stored it in the corner of a hangar because they didn't need it and ebola came along and they hauled this thing out of storage and there it was ready to go right so actually it's <laughs> it's interesting alan given our previous discussion about the crisis mentality that this was actually uh developed uh uh in the event that something like this should yes, happen. Exactly. Well, you remember the story of Lhasa. They medevac somebody back right to here. So that must have been in place. No, they just put her on a commercial airplane. No, yeah. They, yeah, that's true. But, Sitting with everyone yeah. else. Sticks so these folks, <laughs> these folks back in, back in 2008, uh, they started thinking about this because this company, actually, one of their specialties is flying hazardous stuff. They fly a lot of like high explosives around for the military. Um, and they got the idea of, well, what if we have to evacuate 
some patients with contagious diseases. And so they built this whole containment chamber. And the reason uh, it's made out of what looks like flimsy plastic, it's actually some fairly thick, flexible plastic, is that after it's been used, they take down that whole interior envelope and burn it. Right. And they've got this whole decontamination protocol for the aircraft that, and then they test to make sure that they've sanitized the aircraft and um, just very, very, and they, and the pilots who do this, I mean, they ask the guy, well, are you afraid you're going to get Ebola? He says, no, it's spread by direct contact. And I'm, <laughs> Bingo. It's, <laughs> wait a minute, it's airborne. It's just, this, this just, this just hit all the right buttons. If it's in an airplane, it's airborne, damn it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Yuck, yuck, yuck. Nice. Very nice. Kathy, what do you have? Well, I have a pick that's courtesy of Stefan. Mm. Stefan was a postdoc in Christiana's lab, and he has his own faculty position now uh, in Germany at the University of Lübeck. And he picked uh, Fred Murphy's Foundations of Virology page. And uh, Rich had picked the original uh, aspect of this back on TWIV 68. But I thought this was worth repicking because now it's much more accessible. You can download the entire <laughs> PDF of this book. Wow. Uh, it's really nice history with lots of photographs of virology. And also this page just has a nice index of virus images and some papers. Mm. So oh, cool. cool. It's great. Yeah, that's yeah. a really nice uh, – that um, uh, Fred Murphy's ebook is really nice, that yeah. Foundations of Virology. By the way – the classic picture of Ebola that everybody <laughs> looks at that has been going around since the beginning is uh, one of Fred Murphy's electron micrographs. Look at that. Yep. Sure yeah. is. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Very nice. Excellent. And you, you can actually buy the book as a paperback book, too, and there's a link to that. But yeah. if you just want to – and the nice thing about it being a PDF is you can uh, search it. And it's nice. I should probably read that book, Chris. <laughs> should you should read it? You should buy the paperback and I read should it. Do that. I okay. should do that. Very good. Rich Condit, what do you have? So I picked a video <laughs> of an outdoor macro version of what's called a pendulum wave. This is a uh, you know this is a, a a physics demonstration that um, I must have missed. I must have been asleep uh, during <laughs> high school or something because it seems to be a typical thing at any rate uh if you have a uh, a pendulum so some sort of object suspended from a string or whatever uh the uh time the interval that the pendulum swings back and forth is proportional to the length of the string Correct. and so a pendulum wave is a whole bunch of pendulums lined up against each other with uh strings that are different lengths in regular uh, mm -hmm. intervals. Mm -hmm. And if you pull all these back at the same time and get them started swinging at the same time, they're all swinging together to start with, and then they start swinging uh, 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 not together in various wave fashions that get very complex and very interesting until they all come back together again, and then it continues. And it's fascinating. And this particular one is at some uh, park outdoor where people have done it by suspending bowling balls from lines and uh, so that you can see it in a uh, large scale. Uh, but there's links in this particular um, oh, uh, video that. to uh, – to, uh, uh, other smaller Sounds models like where it's easier to see the way. Yeah, you know, cool. the, the, yeah. Rich, you weren't asleep in high school. I didn't have that either. Nobody you didn't? No. You know, Wait, they, I didn't get it. The teachers weren't clever story. enough to use demonstrations like that. Otherwise, I'll we be would have become physicists. <laughs> right? Because whoever is the most clever at presenting their material usually attracts some interesting people. Dixon, did you have a ripple tank in high school? No. Oh, man. Yeah, we had a Wheatstone I, Bridge. A, I used to drive a, across the Wheatstone Bridge every morning. That's, <laughs> I'm going to pick a ripple tank. And that's the Whitestone Bridge. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah well. Cool. All right. My, I have two picks. <clears throat> One of them, if you don't have enough Ebola, uh, ASM just had, if everyone remembers, TWIV 300 was done at ASM headquarters as an after hours. And Who so could forget? Who could forget? Uh, they just did one on Ebola, microbes after hours Ebola. They have two speakers who give talks. So uh, check that out. That's neat. But more importantly, uh, you can get yourself an iPhone 6 TWIV case. 
and I'm putting up the link to the um, oh. to that, which is it's a company called Uncommon, and you can I made the design and I put it there so everyone can see nice. it, and uh, it's thirty bucks, and I'll make some others uh, with time, but I just did this one yeah, for my new phone, so I thought I would share it. And uh, it's just if you want to advertise your love for Twib, there you go. Put it on your phone. <laughs> we have a couple listener picks. Ellen writes, greetings to the Twiverse. I was inspired by Alan's science pick last week and thought I'd share this health map with you as well. Started in 2006 by some scientists, epidemiologists, and software people from Boston Children's Hospital. It's an aggregate of the emerging infectious diseases in an area taken from a variety of data sources. Currently cloudy in Cleveland, temperature 9C feels like 6C. I appreciate the efforts on science communication that you do and look forward to each new episode. And Todd writes, greetings, twivsters. After listening to episode 309 and your discussion of listener Amanda's pick about vaccine ingredients, including formaldehyde, I thought I'd shamelessly plug my own post on formaldehyde and vaccines. Give it a look and let me know what you think. I also did a similar post on MSG and vaccines. Eventually, I'll get around to aluminum. At least, that's what I keep telling myself. Enjoying getting caught up on past episodes. This blog about formaldehyde and vaccines is outstanding. It's very good. It's mm-hmm. really very good. Right, well done, yeah. Todd. I, I love the um, the formaldehyde. Is it is it a microscopic molecule or a cute Disney robot graphic as well? <laughs> That's a nice touch. Yeah, and the health map from the previous writer is a nice one too. Yeah. yeah. When you click on uh, New York, you get Ebola. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's right. That uh, doc, by the way, went home. He's okay. He recovered. Right. And that will do it for TWIV 312 in this episode. is sponsored by Department of Microbiology at Icon School of Medicine. Don't forget, it's a great place for virology. If you want to do a PhD program there, you have until December 1st to apply. That's right around the corner. Yeah, get yeah. moving. And you know, other PhD programs, next year you should advertise with us. One of my students has here, here. applied to the Icon School of Medicine. Good. Mount Sinai. Very good. MSSM.edu slash M-I-C. You know, every time I read that short... What a completed. M-I-C-K-E-Y. <laughs> That's yes. right, exactly. <laughs> wow. But it is not a Mickey Mouse operation. No. It is not. I can vouch for that personally, having been there. Yep. You can find Twiv at twiv.tv and also on iTunes. And, of course, nowadays people stream the episodes from their favorite podcatcher. But uh, for you traditionalists, it's still there. Yes, that's what they're called, Dixon. Uh, you can send your questions and comments to twiv at twiv.tv. Dixon de Pommier can be found at verticalforum.com. And don't miss his latest podcast, Urban Ag. .ws. Thank you, Dixon. Thank you, Vincent. Very nice to have you with us. Feelings mutual. <laughs> You're a silly guy. <laughs> Kathy Spindler is at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. Thank you, Kathy. Thanks. This is fun. Back to virology. Mm-hmm. Rich Condit is at the University of Florida in Gainesville. Thank you, Rich. Sure thing. Great to have everybody back together. This you is bet. fun. And Alan Dove is at turbidplaque.com. You can also find him on Twitter. Thank you, Alan. Always a pleasure. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral. <laughs>